Hello everyone, I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Today we're going to chat about the most inhumane and largest slave auction ever on American soil. On March the 2nd and 3rd of 1859, at the Brock Racecourse in Savannah, Georgia, more than 400 slaves were auctioned off in the most heinous ways. Hundreds of families were separated. And in the two days of the auction, it is said that the skies opened and poured down rain on the racetrack. Many believe that the acts committed were so inhumane that even God cried and the heavens were weeping for the inhumanity that was being committed. And ladies and gentlemen, this is how the weeping time acquired its name. So... With that being said, let's chat. Before we discuss the weeping time and the largest slave auction in American history, I want to give you all a little history about the key people who played major roles in the event. First, we're going to discuss Pierce Meese Butler. Pierce Meese Butler was the owner of the slaves who were auctioned during the weeping time. Pierce inherited his wealth from his grandfather, Major Pierce Butler. Major Pierce Butler was one of the largest slaveholders in the country at a period in time. Major Butler was one of the signatories, or in other words, a signer, of the U.S. Constitution. He was the leading voice for plantation owners at the Constitutional Convention, and he was the sponsor or author, as other reports say, or some reports say rather, of Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution, which demanded that runaway slaves be returned to their masters. And this is also known as the Fugitive Slave Clause. Now, for those of you who don't know, The Fugitive Slave Clause requires that a person held to service labor, or in other words, a slave, apprentice, or indentured servant who flees to another state to escape from slavery must be returned to their master in the state in which they escaped. Even if they had escaped to a free state, they still must be returned to their master. Now, but back to the story. When Major Butler passed away, most of his estate and wealth was passed to his grandson, Pierce Meese Butler, and his brother, John. Now, this included two island plantations on the coast of Georgia. And one of the plantations, it produced rice and the other produced cotton. And more than 900 slaves worked on these plantations. Now, Pierce Butler... He was wealthy, but he really wasn't very good with managing his inheritance and his wealth. And he was said to be a compulsive gambler. And he acquired a significant amount of gambling debt over the years. So in 1856, he was appointed a group of trustees who seized control of his financial assets and worked to clear up his debt. Now, the trustees, they worked for several years in an attempt to clear up Pierce's debt. They sold off various Butler properties and they did all they could do, but they were still unable to free Pierce from his debt. So, figuring out they were still unable to free him from his debt, they all decided that it was, you know, good for Pierce to take all of the movable property on the Georgia plantations and they would split it between Pierce and his brother John and the half of the 900 slaves because that's pretty much what the movable property was the 900 slaves so Pierce's half would be allotted you know to him and it would be sold at auction to relieve him of his remaining financial obligations now one of Pierce's remaining financial obligations was the quarterly payments he was required to pay his estranged ex-wife, Miss Frances Ann Kimball, as part of their divorce agreement made 10 years prior. Now, we must take a moment to talk about Miss Frances Kimball because she is also very important to the story. Now, Frances, better known as Franny, she was married to Pierce for 15 years. 
So, of course, she saw a lot of things. And Frances, when she met Pierce, she was an actress on tour. Now, one of the most ironic things about Franny and Pierce's marriage is that Franny was a very outspoken abolitionist. Now, for those who don't know, or in other words, she was a person who wanted to stop or abolish slavery. Yet, she was married to a man who owned over 400 slaves. Mm -hmm. The irony of it all. But, of course, Fanny, she claimed that when she married Pierce, she had no idea as to how the Butler family acquired their wealth. Now, she stated that she did not find out the true nature of the Butler inheritance, inheritance, I'm sorry, until she visited the plantations from 1838 to 1839. Now, Franny, she had begged Pierce to take her to the plantations because she wanted to witness firsthand the things she had only heard or read about when she was back in England. Now, Pierce, of course, he was very reluctant to take Fanny to the plantations at first. But, of course, she kept at it and he eventually gave in and he gave in in, 18, in late 1838 and he finally took Franny down to the plantations. And what Fanny witnessed during her stay at those plantations, it was just as horrific and inhumane as she had imagined. But while Franny was there, she did keep a record of her stay in her diaries, which were later published as Journal of a Residence on a Georgia plantation, 1838 to 1839. And Franny's story is considered one of the most detailed eyewitness accounts of slavery during that period of time to this very day. However, Franny's journals, they weren't actually published until 1863, but they were published during the middle of the Civil War. And this was mainly because, you know, her and Pierce, they had been going through a custody battle over their two daughters. Now, Pierce, he refused to allow the publications of the journals during the marriage. But when their daughters were of age, Fanny's story was finally published and her story was told to the rural. Now, her journals, they also played a very significant role in the anti-slavery debate occurring at that time that they were actually published. And I know you all want to get back to the story in the auction. But before we get back to the story, let's chat a little bit about what Franny wrote about in her journals. And, you know, while I'm telling you all what Franny wrote, I want you all to keep in mind that according to Franny, the slaves on these particular plantations consider themselves well off when it comes to the other slaves of the neighboring communities. Now, according to Franny's journals, there was a slave on the plantation also named Fanny. I'm sorry, did I call her Fanny? Franny? I meant Fanny. But there was a slave also on the plantation named Fanny who had six children and all were deceased but one. And she went to Pierce's wife, Fanny, and she begged for her work in the fields to be lightened. And now there was another slave that Fanny wrote about, and this slave was named Leah. She was the wife of Caesar. And Leah, she had six children, and three of her children were deceased. And there was another slave that Fanny wrote about, Sally. And I must apologize beforehand before quoting what Fanny said because I really don't want to offend anyone. But to quote Fanny, Sally was a mulatto daughter of a slave, Sophie, and a white man named Walker who visited the plantations. But Sally, she had two miscarriages and three children of whom was deceased. And Sally, she also went to Fanny and complained about horrible pain in her back from working in the fields. And that brings us to another slave named Sarah, who Fanny wrote about. And Sarah, she was Stephen's wife, and she was described as a deplorable case by Fanny. Now, Sarah, she had four miscarriages, and she brought seven children into the world, five of whom were deceased. And she was pregnant again when she went to Fanny, complaining about the dreadful pain in her back. And Sarah believed to have Sarah was believed to have had an internal tumor which swelled when she worked in the fields and Fanny stated that she actually believed that Sally's tumor had ruptured. 
And another one of the slaves, um, which I think was one of the most significant tales that Fanny told from what I read. I haven't read it all yet, but I'm going to. But another slave named Sally, she ran away from the plantation twice. Now, the first time she ran away, she ran into the woods and she eluded discovery for some time before she was tracked and brought back to the plantation. Now, when she was brought back to the plantation, she was tied up by her arms and heavy logs were fastened to her feet before she was severely whipped. Now, you would think that this would scare, you know, Sally and she wouldn't escape again or anything like that. But she did. She escaped for a second time and she spent quite a while in the woods again before being captured. But this time when she returned, she was naked and deranged when she was brought back. And according to Fanny, she pretty much remained in. She calmed down from the derangement, but she pretty much remained in an insane state from that point on. Now, Fanny, she did go to Pierce and talk to him about the slaves' conditions and all of that. But of course, you know, her pleas and cries, they fell upon deaf ears and nothing was ever done and no one really ever cared. But... Pierce and Fanny, they had divorced in 1849, and that was long before the Butler Slave Auction took place. Remember earlier I said that, you know, when I talked about that, I said it was 10 years prior, however. But Joseph Bryan, the notorious slave trader who he was enlisted to actually conduct the Butler Slave Auction. Um, so Pierce wasn't the one actually conducting the auction. And he was supposed to be conducting the slave auction in Savannah's Johnson Square. And that's directly in the center of Savannah. So he was originally supposed to be holding the auction there because that's where Brian's slave holding pens and his brokerage was. But it didn't really pan out that way because when they realized um, that they really didn't have enough room there to accommodate all of the buyers that they were expecting, they decided to move the auction um, down to the Ten Brock race course. And that was about two and a quarter miles west of downtown Savannah. And they pretty much treated the Butler Slave Auction as if it were a normal auction. I mean, the auction was advertised in several newspapers across the South for several weeks leading up to the auction, talking about how they were having this great sale. And, you know, there's, as you all can see, here's one of the actual ads that ran in the Savannah Daily Morning newspaper at the time of the auction. Well, before the auction, rather. Um, the auction it actually became the talk of the town, and the people came from all over to participate in the auction. Some came from as far as Louisiana and Virginia to put in their bids. I mean, before you all say that's not really that far, you all have to think about it and remember that this was in 1859, so they didn't travel the way that we travel now. And according to the reports, the town was buzzing with excitement about the great sale advertised. And the hotels and the bars, they were packed to maximum capacity. Now, luckily, against the crowd was an undercover journalist from the north. And this journalist that was in the crowd was Mr. Mortimer Thompson. Now, New York Tribune editor and noted reformer, Mr. Horace Greeley, he's the one who sent Thomas to Savannah to report on the sale. And Thomas, when he went to Savannah, he pretty much traveled incognito as a potential buyer to get close to the auction. And this was a very good and wise decision because after he you know, got back and he published his article, his life was being threatened. Um, Thomas wrote an article titled The Great Auction Sale of Slaves at Savannah, Georgia, which was published in the Tribune and then republished in Philadelphia and London, causing a complete international stir. Now, Thomas held nothing back in his articles. So it was claimed that Thomas's piece was an anti-slavery hit job by northern abolitionists. And that's pretty much exactly what it was. Now, in Thomas's article, he explained that when he arrived, he saw the slaves, the men, the women and the children stuffed, stacked and squished together in horse and carriage stalls at the racetracks. 
according to Thomas, they were stacked together and treated worse than cattle and only given enough food and water to prevent them from falling ill and dying. Now, Thomas, he stated that he could see only grief upon the face of all of the caged slaves. And he goes even further to state that some of the slaves appeared to accept their fate as human property. Some of them, they held their hands in their heads. I'm sorry, their heads in their hands. And they had only sorrow on their face. And others, they were pretty much restless and they shook constantly and they never still. They just shook and shivered. Now, on the day of the auction, Thomas, he wrote that the auction was a very disgraceful and inhumane affair. And he states that the slave spectators at the auction, you know, looking to make their bids, they inspected the slave like livestock. They poked, prodded, pinched the slave's muscles, checked the insides of their mouths, and they made obscene comments at some of the female slaves. Thomas provides details about a few of the slaves that were sold at the auction. One of the slaves he talked about is Jeffrey. Now, Jeffrey, he tried to get his buyer to purchase a woman named Dorcas. And this woman was Jeffrey's fiance. But his buyer, he refused to purchase her when he discovered that he would have to purchase her entire family just to purchase her. And Thomas, he also talked about a slave woman named Daphne. Now, when she came up for auction, Daphne was wrapped in a shoal with her infant. She was trying to keep the chilled air and the rain from them because it was raining really hard. Um, I mean, it was cold. And according to the reports, it was raining so hard that it appeared that the skies had opened and the heavens were weeping. Some even state that it rained so hard, it appeared as if God himself was crying and... The heavens were weeping about the inhumanity that was taking place. Now, as Daphne stood there in the cold and in the pouring rain, trying to cover herself and her baby with a shawl, the men started to surround her at the auction, and they started to try and snatch her shawl as they yelled at the auctioneer. What do you keep your ninja covered up for? Now, I did say the word ninja because I can't say the actual word on YouTube, but you all pretty much know what they said. The man went further to say, pull off her blanket. Who's going to bid on that ninja if you keep her covered up? Let's see her face. They were shouting this as they gathered even closer to Daphne. And then they continued to yell and curse. And they said things so horrific and obscene that the reports refused to even repeat what they said. So we can only imagine what they really said to this woman while she was holding the child in the rain. But um, Mr. Pierce Butler, he decided to make his appearance and show up at the auction. And he showed up and he used a gloved hand to actually shake the hands of a few of his favorite slaves. And after the auction, Pierce gave a few of his favorite slaves a dollar in some fresh coins as if that was any form of compensation for ripping them and their families apart. Sorry, Pierce. There's no compensation for that, sir. But anyway, once the auction was over, 436 men, women, and children were auctioned off. The two-day sale brought in a grand total of $303,850. The highest paid price for one family, which was a mother and her five grown children, was $6,180. And the highest price paid for one individual was $1,750. And the lowest price paid for a slave was $250. Mm, sad. It's just really, really sad. Now, the 10 Broke Race Course is no longer, it no longer exists, of course. And there is now a lumber company on most of the land and an elementary school sits on the corner where the racetrack once was. Now, it's pretty easy to assume that most, if not all, of the children who attend the school have no idea about the history of the grounds that they walk on on a regular basis. 
and the city of Savannah, they placed a marker, you know, two miles of, well, well, two miles west of downtown Savannah, Georgia, dedicated to the horrible events 149 years later, on March the 3rd, 2008. And Mayor Otis Johnson, he was the second African-American to hold that office. He gave a speech honoring the enslaved men, women, and children whose labor helped to build the oldest city in the state of Georgia. Well, that brings us to the end of today's chat. You all, please tell me what you think in the comments below. Please like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. And I want to thank you all for the thousand views on my Igbo landing video. We're getting there. We're getting there slowly but surely. And I really appreciate you all. So please subscribe and like the video so we can keep on climbing. You all can support if you would like. The information to support will be in the description box below. And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.